All right, everybody, we're live. Um, we'll give people a couple minutes to hop on and then we'll just jump right into it. Also, I'll say if you're watching um, Facebook Live on a different device, uh, please mute it um, or else we'll, you know, while you're talking, we'll hear it. <laughs> Feedback, which I learned the hard way. All right, um, let's get started. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Wolf Brack. I'm the operations manager and curator at Interurban Art House. Um, thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, this event is a um, it's a storytelling night, but it's also kind of a, a little little snippets, an exploration into like little snippets of what make up uh, our queer culture. And it's a part of a larger show that we do every year called Exhibition, um, The Queer Experience. So we, um, we, we show work from queer artists uh, from all over the, the area. Um, and we, this way we can also highlight some of our writers and speakers and storytellers um, our literature folks, our poets, uh, and give them some airtime too. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for being here. I also want to thank Humanities Kansas, um, who sponsored this event. Uh, make sure that we can kick everybody uh, a little cash for for their time and their expertise. Um, I won't I won't take up too much time. Um, I want to go ahead and introduce our host Mitchell King. Uh, poet, educator, mystical, magical, <laughs> unicorn person. Um, I will unmute you and yeah, you're good. Take it away, Mitchell. Event unto himself, but yes, we digress. Um, hi everyone, I'm Mitchell. I serve as the uh, queer humanity scholar on this project. Um, for our exploration of queer culture. I just want to thank everybody for participating and tuning in as we are share our experiences and our arts with each other and with the wider world, especially because we feel so closed off right now. It's great to be connected again. Um, to kick things off, I'm going to read a poem from my book, The Mostly True Memoirs of a Witch, available for uh, purchase on Stubborn Mule Press and Amazon. When Sylvia Plath was a drag queen, I have stolen a life. I wake up to the sun and put on her face. The kids are away for the weekend and their father is my enemy. I write, I have exercised him entirely. And then I kiss his picture. Hatred has always been my muse. The lights and then the laughter. Remember the college bar they thought you were a peeper for pissing in the stall when you were masquerading as Miss Gay Fraternity Boy 2015? It was a hoot for them, and then the shadow never leaves the floor. Someone you wanted, and then something that gone. Straight men and beer stink. At once we want to be filled with them and be done with them. The fucked and befriended, and then left alone forever. If Sylvia Plath was a drag queen, would she have filmed herself lip syncing her own verse, shaping her mouth to say, Daddy, Daddy, punish me, I'm the worst? Would she have stuck a pale hand out for your spare dollar? Would you give it to her? Would you pay her for the pain, for the cost of the A-line dress, for the red silk, for the shoes her feet are too big in? Drag queens don't make money. But back to the death as that's all this exercise guarantees, an object to pray to when it's over. Can I steal her death from her? And is that saving or damnation? My mother is smaller now than ever, her bones creaking with the cancer that hangs above us like a guillotine. The shadow is back, 
and the shadow never left. It was dancing beside me the whole time, my leg in the air mirrored by the jigging tentacle on the floor. Thank you. I want to introduce our next performer, Jade Green. Jade Green, they, them, is a Black Kansas City-based musician, educator, and healer. When they are not farming, making herbal medicine, or coordinating with various educational events for the Black community, they write and sing for the Black Creatures and Orquesta del Sol Sol, two musical endeavors Afrofuturist in nature. Yay, I did it. I think I did it. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> Give me just one moment. I'm trying to join via laptop and I am totally gonna put us about two minutes behind with this. So please bear with me. Um, I wanna start off by saying, I'm really thankful for this opportunity. This is really cool. And I'm gonna tell some stories tonight about mostly my childhood. Gotta love it, good old days. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna, oh, I'm also here with my familiar, uh, Luna Bell. <laughs> um, but I do wanna start the night off uh, with um, a little bit of land reverence, um, in which we just acknowledge that we're on stolen land. Okay, cat. Um, <laughs> where I want to acknowledge, um, I am standing on the product of soil cultivated, tended to, loved on for countless generations by the Ocheti, the Wasage, which many people know as Osage, and the Choctaw peoples. Here we go. I think I'm about to join the laptop, so that'll be fun. Just a moment, please. Yay. Okay. I think I've done it. Um, can I see a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay. Perfect. Awesome. I done it. Okay. Y'all. Yay. Queer storytelling. Oh my goodness. Yeah. In honor of the African and queer history on which those shoulders I stand. Um, I just am so thankful to be able to be telling stories, which both cultures are very rich in, um, have a very rich history of storytelling. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just gonna talk. Being queer is made out to be a political statement, kind of like being black, even when we are avoiding politics. Someone always tries to make it our business without fail. Like, <laughs> like, um, like people either force us to share our opinions for sport or they're just pushing our buttons for reactions. Like I'm in line, right, at the grocery store. You don't need to ask me anything about the Supreme Court. You don't. <laughs> no, I, I don't have to explain my shirt to you. You need to go Google her. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not going to center you like you're the main character of a video game. And I am just an NPC formulated specifically for your gaming uh, experience. <laughs> and I don't mean to burst anyone's bubble, but there's just a lot of people in the world who are deeply, deeply disturbed by queer joy, by black joy, by the way gender and race and sexuality and presentation are all on totally different circuits, independent of, but also adding depth to each other, right? So um, we can get into that another time though. That's, you know, that's for the talk later on. Uh, <laughs> um, I should say, if you do want to follow any of the stuff that I'm doing, um, you can follow the Black Creatures on Instagram, Facebook, I don't know, Orquesta del Sol Sol. I'm not trying to plug myself though, I just really believe in the power of being able to speak and be with, and in sort of in community with one another, so. But, um, but yeah, so tonight I wanna start with, uh, <laughs> I, just, I just wanna immortalize and share some stories with y'all during Times New Rona, as my friend 
coined, I guess. Um, so my first story is about middle school. Such a weird time in everyone's life, particularly for those who aren't, uh, who, who know they aren't straight by then. And I myself thought I was bisexual at the time. Um, and you know what else? I was also telling my friends, don't call me pretty, just call me handsome or don't acknowledge my appearance at all. And up until this point, I was living in a Bible centric house in the country where they always made me wear dresses unless I was on the tractor or snow was on the ground. Um, then I got to wear overalls or jeans. Um, and I think part of my tomboy phase was brought on by that repression, but wanting to be called handsome, that's something different. Oh, and then I started going by Seth. I didn't know any trans people at the time, so I had nothing to base this experience off of. Um, but it's so obvious now. I've been gender fluid forever. And nonetheless, at like 13, 12, whatever age I was, um, if I was a boy, I knew I was a bisexual one. And so I started dating this guy named Robert online, who was also around my age. So don't worry, it wasn't that weird. It was just middle school weird. Um, and you know, middle school kids on the internet and finding true love. We talked on the phone for like hours all the time. And then I got nervous one day. I was like, what if he finds out I'm not a boy? And I realized now the real problem was my sex and not my gender, but back to the story. I was laying in bed. I was home from school. I was like chronically ill as a kid. And I was also very, very depressed. So I had just laid in bed all day. And I was like, just this gut, this pit in, in the center of my stomach was like, you got to tell him, you got to come clean. You got to, the word I now know is disclosure. Um, I, I had to disclose to him who I was. So I did. And I wrote a goddamn poem and it was like a limerick. It was like, um, it was like, I know you like me quite a bit. I like you as well. You're the shit. But man, I have titties and now I feel shitty, but it's fair if you just want to call it quits. Like it was really, really not good. It was probably, <laughs> it was, uh, it was better worded than that, I'm sure. But I had absolutely no clue how to write a poem. So I just copied some straight up Dr. Seuss shit. And you know what he says back? He goes, oh, fuck me too, actually. <laughs> which is just iconic. We ended up staying friends for like, I mean, I still have um, this person added on Facebook. I'm not gonna do all that because that's just not necessary, but like, we're still, we check in on each other. We're always like, oh yeah, that's so good. We like each other's stuff, we're good. But what was so impactful about this too is that, um, I'm gonna use he pronouns because we were operating off of at the time. He said, it's okay, we're cool. You know, you're still Seth though, bro or whatever. And it was like, it was so sweet and it was heartwarming. But let me be clear, my experience there is not meant to imply that being trans or gender fluid is all peaches and funny poems about disclosure and affirmations from the people that you care about. This is one of the few stories I can share in which I experienced a gender euphoria while engaging with other people and not just alone in my room, in my mirror, taking interesting camera angles of myself to try and have some reference for like how I wanted to present gender wise, so. Next story is from high school, American history. Uh, my teacher's name was Mr. Brousseau, which is funny. He was an American history teacher, but his last name was like incredibly French, like <laughs> aggressively French. Um, and so I remember we didn't get along very well. He, uh, he brought up once how attractive Jodie Foster was during a lesson. And I agreed very loudly and I'm, I feel bad if you know some for by some purpose like Jodie Foster is watching because I definitely had you mixed up with Jillian Anderson aka Scully from the X-Files it doesn't matter the point is um both of those reactions should have probably raised questions like why was this 15 year old talking about these grown women and why was this teacher talking about these grown women anyway uh we're on the unit where we learn about eastern Europeans coming to this land and how they had trouble getting into the U.S. because of their dark, thick hair on their heads and on their bodies. And I don't know how accurate that even is, but the next thing I know, this guy's talking about the word swarthy, which um, I know only based off of reference for like description of pirates. 
So he says, yeah, he's talking about swarthy. He said, he points across the room to me and he goes, yeah, like Jade. And he's smiling and he says, I bet if you didn't shave for a couple of days, everyone would think that you were swarthy. And he like laughed about it. And a couple students were like, uh, uh, it didn't catch on. It didn't catch, I remember. And um, so I'm sitting there in the middle of the classroom <laughs> And I'm thinking, oh my God, this guy's just called attention to my leg hair. And I'm like, I was one of the only black students in the classroom for one. So like my hair just behaves different. And uh, that was the day I decided to stop shaving. I was like, you know what? <laughs> it started off as a protest just to this specific teacher, but then it ended up like a good friend of mine toward the end of the school year uh, who, did, who did yearbook, they wrote a whole freaking story they had a whole page and it was like just one picture of me like posed with my armpit hair <laughs> like, this is high school and um yeah yeah it was it was pretty exciting they also they're living their best non-binary life now additionally and it's funny because god childhood's confusing <laughs> but uh yeah oh gosh i guess i don't have too many more minutes left is that right <laughs> I'm okay. Okay. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna tell another story then, if that's cool. Just a couple more minutes. Is that good or okay? Um, so this last one is about self gaslighting. Um, I used to really try to push down my feelings about gender because. I don't experience life-threatening gender dysphoria. I figured I was cis and that there was nothing more to ponder. But then I remember, I remember the way my heart fluttered and my ears sort of perked up when I heard First Nations indigenous people had at least five genders before Americanization stripped them of their culture. I remember confusing things too. I remember my mom telling me black people don't end up gay as much as white people. Um, I remember going to, when I got older, I went to queer parties in Kansas City and they were like 90% white. And I was always part of the diversity of these events. It was a confirmation of what my mother had told me. So that was additionally confusing. I remember feeling like the least cool and most othered at the party of others. And for the first time, I felt shame for not being queer enough instead of the usual being too much of literally anything, anytime. And it was so hard to put my finger on the feeling, knowing something was wrong. And I came to understand that black bodies, as well as fat bodies, disabled bodies, trans bodies, let me say differently abled bodies on that, um, and trans bodies are aggressively degendered and regendered by an observing dominant culture. Hortine Spillers writes about this in Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe. It's like 19 pages. It's phenomenal. Um, it is black centric. And I felt people's eyes like tearing me down and building me back up with a framework that they could better understand. Like if you've ever seen two white people arguing about race issues just back and forth, but like silently, that's sort of what it felt like watching the way people would speculate without interacting. And then in 2018, the Ferguson uprising happened. And when it happened, I saw more LGBTQIAers calling out the racism in our communities on Tinder, on Grindr and more. And blatant racism was getting put on blast. So that was cool. And then I saw something else happen. I saw a sort of um, POC philia in which um, white queers would keep one good friend of color to absolve themselves of any possibility of being racist. And I went from being observed through a glass case to being invited to be the only person of color on a Q&A panel about diversity. It was sick. And y'all see how light skinned I am. There's, if I'm the only black person at your event, there is something wrong. There is definitely something, unless you don't want black people part of the conversation then it's you're doing the thing right but um but yeah it was weird and uh speaking of which this is really this is a great lineup i'm i'm loving this um so anyway i spent a long time trying to figure out where i sat on the intersection particularly i spent a long time trying to figure out if i was faking being who i was which is called imposter syndrome where you're constantly 
making magical pixie noises come out of your phone where you're <laughs> where you are constantly worried you're coming off as fake to other people all the time or even worse worrying about whether or not you are faking it to yourself but someone told me something that really stuck with me the other day and they said cis people don't fantasize about being another gender they don't fantasize about being another gender. I was like, oh shit, wait. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but that just really hung with me the other day. And I was like, oh, maybe I'm working toward living my truth, who knows? Anyway, I'm really excited for the rest of the night. And thank y'all so much. Inner Urban Art House, you're awesome. I'm Jade Green, signing off <laughs> or whatever. Uh, Jake, thank you so much for sharing. We're so happy that you could join us tonight. That was phenomenal. I already have so many questions for you for like the panel later, or more so our like discussion later, especially about uh, not being queer enough. I think that's a fun theme for all of us. Um, but our next performer is Joss Barton. Joss is a writer, journalist, and spoken word performance artist exploring and documenting queer and trans life, love, and liberation. Her work blends femme fever dreams over the soundtrack of the American Nightmare, combining prose poetry, nonfiction, confessional essays, drag artistry, and spoken word stage performances. Joss examines the myriad states of queer trans womanhood from historical, political, and pop cultural identities of death, desires, dreams, and disco. What an amazing intro. Joss, take it away. Hello. How y'all doing? Uh, my name is Joss Barton. And this is a story of how I came into my womanhood and almost fucked trash. So I was born in 1986 in Guatemala City, Guatemala. And I am a child of adoption and my parents are white and they came from Missouri. They flew all the way to Guatemala did all of the necessary paperwork, citizenship paperwork with the consulate. And here is this brown little baby in the middle of rural Missouri. And not only am I a brown little baby in white rural Missouri, but I'm a brown little queer sissy baby in white rural Missouri. And I think for my parents, I'm having this bundle of joy that is um, brown and they are not brown, they are white and who is very femme and very queer and they are not queer. Um, it was a challenge, but I remember knowing who I was at a very young age, like a lot of trans people kind of have that memory and not even really questioning it. I remember just reveling in my feminist. I remember stealing my mother's makeup bags and putting on her blush and her rouge and her candy apple lipstick. I remember putting her rollers in my hair and begging my cousins to let me roll their hair up with her rollers. I remember walking like a newborn fawn who doesn't know how to have control of their knees or their legs right after they're born when I would slip on her pumps and walk around the closet in the living room with these high heels that I didn't know how to walk in. And I remember putting on her dresses and her skirts and her negligees and putting on shows for my family, entertaining them with songs or little dances. And one of my favorite photos of my childhood is me wearing my mom's pink satin negligee 
next to my little brother who's in cowboy boots <laughs> and I'm wearing this pink teddy loving every moment of it and there's this photograph of us and it's one of my most prized possessions and it is one of my most prized possessions because it really encapsulates just the sheer joy but also the sheer whateverness of who I was like it was just me it, there was no conditioning yet there was no this is wrong there was no you shouldn't do that it was just me right but as a lot of queer people and a lot of trans people and a lot of non-binary people know as you get older the cuteness wears off that that differentness becomes dangerous and obviously the conditioning of being in a very white church in a very white school and a very white family started to come in hard and fast I remember running across the yard with my girlfriends and I probably couldn't have been more than like 10 or 12 but I am a full sissy gate right like I am limp wristed and I'm squealing and I'm having a good time and unbeknownst to me my mother had watched me run across the field from the house and she pulls me aside pulls me away from my girlfriends and pulls me into a room by ourselves and she looks at me in the eyes and she says you will not run like that again you will not act like that again. That is not how men and boys act. That's not how men and boys run. And from that moment, I remember a distinct conditioning of how I should move my body in the world, how I should be perceived in the world. And obviously I was already getting so much hateful messages from the pulpit, from a very bigoted Christian theology from the schoolyard when we all remember, if any of us were millennials, you remember the term that's so gay, like all of those things, you know, building up and building up in your mind, just constricts you and makes you really question every move you make in the world. Um, but I was very fortunate in that I had many people in my life in that community, in that environment that still loved me, that still protected me and that still uplifted me, even if they didn't know what exactly they were uplifting. Um, I remember my grandfather being so protective of me. Like I was the sissiest grandchild of all grandsons. I'm talking about like 10 boys in the family. And I am clearly the queerest one out of all of them. But I remember distinctly my grandfather being very protective of me, being very gentle with me. And when things would get weird, when people would have those annoying questions about, do you have a girlfriend yet? You know, my grandfather would shut that down really fast and just smile at me, give me a little wink and just give me a hug because he knew he knew that I was different and he tried to protect me as best he could, right? And I remember having my high school English teacher um, doing a similar protection and a similar wrapping of around of me um, with my work as a writer and recognizing that I had a gift with words and with literature and with story. And I would write about pretty queer gay things, you know, as a 16 year old would. And this is pre Tumblr. Okay, so <laughs> I'm like, really talking about gay stuff. But I had a fabulous English teacher that just supported me and encouraged me and was like, you should keep writing, you should keep writing. And I kept writing. And as I got older, and as I kind of moved further and further away from that little, that little kid and the pumps. I found myself in my mid twenties out of college. At this point, I had already 
curated and crafted an amazing queer family around me, amazing queer people of color. I finally had close family, chosen family that were black, that were brown, that were trans, that were queer. But even in all of that, I still, there was still something missing. And I couldn't ever really understand what it was, but I found myself um, on a camping trip with about 300 queer people. It was a camping trip that my ex-boyfriend and I um, used to go on and we still were going on them and we weren't together at the time, but this was another person that had always uplifted me and had always encouraged me. And even though we weren't together, um, we went on this camping trip again because we had always done it and we were happy to do it. And someone in the mix has tabs of LSD. My favorite drug of all time. But at the time, I had never done a psychedelic. I hadn't really done drugs at all at the time. And we're sitting in the tent. And we're like, should we do it? Do you want to do it? I don't know. We're in the woods. Should we do it? Is it smart to do acid in the woods? I don't know. Well, I pop it in my mouth, take a drink of my cocktail. I'm like, well, let's just go to the river. So we walk down to the river together. and. If you've ever done acid, it hits you quickly, especially if all you've been ingesting are hot dogs and beer for three days straight. <laughs> and everything changes, right? The filter shifts, the soundtrack shifts, and I'm surrounded by 300 queer people in the middle of the woods in this fabulous river. And the river becomes this huge ocean of diamonds. The sun becomes the brightest, most orange sun I've ever seen. The wind is hitting me like I'm on like Mount Everest, but I'm in Missouri and everything is fabulous. And then we're having a good time and we're cackling and we're geeking and we're cutting up. Um, but something again shifts in my head and I'm drawn to the woods and everyone is partying like I'm I don't know why I want to leave this party but I walk to the edge of the river and I follow a little trail and I find myself in a tiny little clearing and I just sit there and everything around me is moving the trees the grass the flowers the bushes and they become people like they're, they have human form, they have arms, they have heads, they have legs, they have breasts and titties and pussies and they're fucking and they're dancing and they're grinding and their genders are changing in real time and it's all happening around me. And I'm laying there on the ground surrounded by this like wave of orgasmic nature. And in the middle of it, it really feels as if this billboard falls straight from the sky, lands in front of me, and I am left with the simple truth that you are a woman, you need to transition, and if you do not, you will continue to be miserable. And this is what you need to do to be happy. And I laid there and looked up at the sky and I cried, like tears of joy. They were not sad tears. It was honestly the first time I ever cried tears of joy ever in my entire life. And I'm crying and I'm laughing and I'm also weirdly horny at the same time because it's acid, right? <laughs> These trees are fucking around me. <laughs> and I'm having this amazing experience and I'm just like, you're right. Whatever is speaking to me, you're right. I, I, I need to transition and this is what I've been, this is what I've been, putting off for so long. And I was ultimately crying because I had finally reconnected with that little girl in her mom's rollers and her mom's pumps. And it felt like coming home, even though I was in the middle of the woods. And it was amazing. But the sun is going down and it's getting late and 
all my friends have left the river. I could hear them backing up and leaving. I'm like, oh fuck, like I'm the last one standing. So let me wrap this up. Let me get my towel. Let me get my cooler. I don't want to be out here when it's too dark. And I'm on acid. I've never been on acid before. So I pack up and I walk past the river and I'm walking back towards the camp. And I reach the, the parts of where the tents are and the RVs are. And if you've ever been on a camping trip with 300 plus queer people, once the sun goes down, the freaks come out to play, honey. It's a free for all. So I had already spent a couple of days of like seeing some freaky deaky stuff. And I, I liked it. I was like, well, you know, maybe I'll have a little show on my way back to camp. And I'm walking, I don't see anyone around. I'm like, okay, maybe maybe people are tired. Maybe they got their nut out. I don't know. But here I come up and there's this threesome happening. These three men are just fucking and sucking and doing everything I love to see. And I'm like, oh shit, this is, this looks, looks like some good shit. And I'm like already feeling myself because I had this revelation. And I'm like, well, what's a better way to fucking tap, cut, you know, like cap the night than having some dope sex on acid after I've had this huge revelation about who I am as a human being. So I, I was like, maybe they'll let me join it. I don't know, let me go ask. So I walk up and I'm like, hey, what's going on? What's going on y'all? And as the lamp that's there hits them and I walk up on them, I realize it is just a pile of trash bags. <laughs> sitting under a light <laughs> where we had been dumping all of our food and bottles and beer cans. It was just the trash pile. So that is how I came into my womanhood and almost fucked a pile of trash. So yeah. And if you're a woman that fucks men, you can probably relate to that story a little bit. <laughs> There we go. Hi, can everyone hear me? I'm sorry, I was resolving some technical difficulties. Go okay, wonderful. Um, so our next performer is David Wayne Reed. He, him, his is an actor, writer, director, and filmmaker from Kansas City, Missouri. Works include Eternal Harvest, Goliath, Help Yourself, and Jolly Rancher. He is currently in production on his film Land and Flower about the endangered native tall grass prairie remnants. Reed hosts and produces the popular show and tell storytelling series Shelf Life. Thank you. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. Um, wow, Joss, I just have to say, I really identify with the growing up rural, rural and gay. I grew up in Lewisburg, Kansas, and Jade was on a tractor. So I really love the rural otherness and really identify <laughs> with that. So thank you for taking me on that journey. Um, so I, I'm going to, my queer experience actually uh, traces back in some ways to. Um, nuclear holocaust and so mine is a story about um, fear of the apocalypse and survival and it's based around a um, movie that was made here in kansas city in 1983 story is called the day after i'm going to do a shorter short story and then i'm going to do a teeny tiny little short story after that the day after on November 20th, 1983, ABC aired the made-for-TV movie event, The Day After, a movie about nuclear holocaust filmed right here in Kansas City. I was 11 years old, and I made the horrible mistake of watching it alone, and seeing this movie at this age profoundly fucked my life, okay? I was already sensitive, dramatic, and hormonal, but now I was just panicked, traumatized, morbid, and just deathly afraid. In this movie, there is this insufferably long montage of mushroom clouds, hellfire, and death. The fire rushes over town and country like a flood of flames. This is the money shot. 
I watch as people, Kansans just like me, are evaporated by fire and burned to extinction in skeletal x-ray vision. But even in the aftermath, there are survivors. In this fallout, the people have taken to stacking corpses in mass burial sites and, making, uh, and building makeshift encampments out of plastic sheeting and duct tape. People have resorted to looting, hijacking, rape, murder, and cannibalism. One survivor says, what matters is that we're alive and we're together. There may not be food, water, or electricity in this scorched after earth, but there are miraculously still cigarettes. A doctor of all people pulls a drag on his cig and says, we're lucky to be alive. Someone else in the room says, Hiroshima was peanuts. I knew then that I would not want to survive. I wouldn't even want to. I don't even like it when the electricity goes out. If and when the world all falls down, I planned on falling down with it. I will take it as it comes. I will go with the flow. See, I'm not a survivalist or some doomsday prepper because actually that just seems like a whole hell of a lot of work for very little payoff. Why would I want to live in a world where only the fittest survived, where we live in underground silos and learn to subsist on radioactive cans of cat food, pork and beans, or dead relatives? No thanks. But this was the most hyperbolic of doomsday visions and scenarios. More often, survival and her sister resilience reveal themselves in more everyday, less apocalyptic scenarios. To be a survivor, you have to overcome something. You have to persist, finding the resilience, determination, and conviction to carry on, to endure, despite all that endangers us, every single fucking thing that endangers us. So in this respect, I am a survivor. And the fact that you all are here with me now proves that you are too. We will survive until we don't. Anything can happen at any time. And you know what? That's the good news and the bad news. I've nearly died many, many times, many more than I'd care to admit. I've nearly drowned three different times. I have nearly choked to death. I've nearly suffocated. I have been stung by a swarm of bees. I have been mauled by dogs. I have drank to dangerous excess. I have not known when to say when, again and again and again and again. I have rolled a car. I have broken a light pole in half with, my car, with a car. My life has been threatened. I have been kidnapped and I have considered suicide. But here I am and here I remain. And sometimes I wonder if that's luck or if that's punishment. But survival makes me unafraid. I know that there is a space between this life and the next. That space is the full spectrum, the full rainbow, the giant rolling vacuum of the in-between, the space that feels like the space between two magnets. That is the space of becoming. We become and we keep becoming and becoming and becoming all of life, this river flowing, and our death is the fertilizer of new life, and that is why there is nothing to fear. There's freedom in that. Because we get second chances. In fact, we get infinite chances and infinite possibilities. We're all in the stream flowing from life to life with only a brief death in between. Oh yes, there is a link between. The elderly see it coming, and the newborns have just come from it. I have seen it as I watched my grandma die. I have seen it in the eyes of my great niece after she was born. Look into their eyes. Look into the horizon of their gaze. They clearly see this. And that is as close as we can get to death without dying ourselves. I do not fear these bad times. I know that they are necessary to usher in the good times because one always follows the other, like the rain holding the door open for the rainbow. That is why the fire germinates the seed of the great sequoia. And that's why they burn the prairies in the spring, setting free the spring. Today, tomorrow, 
and the day after. Thank you. Um, this next is a short little story. It was a writing prompt that was given to me by a fantastic friend and writer, poet Jen Harris. Um, it was asking, the prompt was about childhood and I ended up writing, what came out in the 10 minute spurt was writing about the child that I will not have and the father that I will not become. <clears throat> I have a son and his name is Endymion. He's always existed within me as a fantasy, as a possibility. My seed, my son, this legacy of me. He is the son I do not have. He is the imaginary family that I begat, although he only lives at the intersection of possibility and promise, the myth of a life unlived. Endymion is his name and he is named after the mythological character, a god and a child who always lives in his dreams. But isn't that the most perfect of childhoods? To live in a dreamscape, free to wander, to play, to explore. Endymion is the son I want slash do not want. I know that if he is brought into my reality, into this reality, his dreams and this dream ceases to be because perfection is a trick, perfection is a trap, and maybe so too is childhood. In my dream and in his, Endymion stays perfect, and so too can my vision. I would not wish reality off on him because I love him too much. He is the pearl in my hand, he is the rainbow in my heart, Endymion, Endymion, Endymion. Child of dreams, sweet child of mine, Endymion. Be not born, please. Do not bother. I love you more from here, from this intimate distance. You are on the pedestal of my dreams, and as long as you are there, I will never disappoint you. Upon the throne of my highest ideals, you can remain, allowing me the fantasy of fatherhood. Endymion, my son. I worship your potential, the perfection of you and your rest. I gaze at you when I close my eyes and I see you nestled in a manger of stars, sleeping peaceful and in perfection in my dreams and you in yours. Thank you. David, thank you so much for sharing that piece with us. I really kind of like that. Awesome, I love this. <laughs> I like the, the queerness outside of urban environments is a theme we keep hitting on, right? That's wonderful. Um, our next performer is Luann Fox. Luann Fox is an area high school educator, speaker, and writer. She is a fellow journey person in navigating experience, change, and acceptance for all. Names have been changed in her piece to avoid dead naming. Thank you. Hi. So I'm an area high school educator, and I teach high school kids all day long. But here's the story of how I needed to learn from my first transgender student about seven years ago. So I delivered what I am sure was one of my very best lectures. I am sure it was a wonderful lesson and the, and the period is over and everybody's filed out of the room, except for a student who comes back into the room and she is dragging another girl by the hand, comes up to my desk and she says, <clears throat> after drawing herself up, <clears throat> I know I've gone by Tara ever since school has started, but now I need to go by Troy and I need for you to use male pronouns from here on. And, and Tara could have said anything else to me and I would have been less surprised because Tara was someone I knew from the first day of school as someone who wore overalls, had butchy hair, no makeup, had a swagger. And apparently since she could drag a girl in by the hand, I'm thinking, I got you. I understand who you are. You're some baby dyke. Whether or not you know it is another thing, but 
you're somebody who's gay and I got this. But that is not what she was telling me. She wasn't telling me she was a lesbian. She was telling me she was a boy. And it isn't like I didn't know that transgender kids existed. Of course I did. But this was the first time that this person came and told me this in my classroom. And it was November, people. It was November. It's not like it was the first day of school. It would have been so much easier from the first day of school to just have known that identity and gone forward. But no, I had my whole microcosm going, right? I had my classroom, my students. I had everything known. And I figured I knew Tara but I didn't. And again, it was November and I thought of me. I didn't think of the courage that it would take for Troy really to come and tell me what he needed to tell me so that I could hear it. I was thinking about how I was gonna shift my focus. I was thinking about how I was gonna deal with my students and like, how would my students feel? So I was thinking about that. And it's so interesting because I'm supposed to be the cool one, right? I'm the open teacher. In fact, I'm the open secret. I'm the one that students are supposed to come to and know that they can be okay and know that they can be who they are. So my outside affect did not match what I was feeling inside because I am sure outside I said things like, okay, thank you. And uh, I, will, I will do that going forward. But inside, I felt confused. I felt very confused. And I took my confusion home. And I was really, really bothered by this. And I thought, God, why am I bothered by this? I need to get down to like why I'm bothered by this. And I thought, I don't know what the hell is the matter here, but is this a person who just needs to piss people off? Is this the new way of doing that, right? Is this the new rebellion coming up? Is this what the new blue hair is? That's literally what I thought at the beginning. Tattoos aren't enough anymore, right? Piercings aren't enough anymore. This is the way that we have to show that we're different so that we can bug you. Ah, and then I'm trying to mine through my own confusion and I know I have to get to it. And I'm thinking, what is going on? Is this a person who's afraid to grow up? Did the person who told me that she needed a change from Tara to Troy, was she thinking, I don't know, I'm getting tits and a period and, you know, I'm looking down the road and, you know, being a woman is going to be a raw deal for me. So I can just opt out. I don't want to be a woman. And I was thinking to myself, um, that's not anything that I ever wanted for me. That's not anything that I ever really understood. So I was still confused and it just didn't help me. And then I remembered, you know, I'm a teacher and as a teacher, you know, we're supposed to teach people to attach new knowledge to something that they've already learned. So I'm going to do that with myself. And I'm thinking seven years ago, what do I already know about my relationship with transgender people? And the only one I could come up with was a transactional one. It was my dentist. I had a dentist named John for a number of years. One time I went to my dentist, John, though, and John, said, John told me that there would be changes coming. And John did not feel like he was John anymore. John needed to become somebody else because John believed that he was somebody else. So he was foregrounding for me that these changes were going to occur. You see your dentist like twice a year, right? So six months later, still John, but with changes the changes he told me that were coming. So I'd get the long eyelashes, I get the long hair, right? The, the, like the, the fingernails that are gonna be painted and everything. And then John is talking to me and he's all in my mouth, only in a way that dentists can do, right? Like, so you're like a complete captive, right? And he's like yapping about like all of the changes. And so I'm under, I'm trying to listen to what those are. And then six months later for another checkup and there is no more John. It's Michelle, my dentist. So I now I have a female dentist and I'm thinking, John, Michelle, John, Michelle. And, and in my really limited understanding at this point, I'm thinking, why not John, Jonna, Juana? Why not something that looks like that? I didn't understand the complete break in the name. So, you know, because I'm older, I'm thinking John, Michelle, that's like half of the quartet of the mamas and the papas. So facetiously, I'm thinking like, I don't know, are we gonna to get to the Mama Cass identity at some point? Are we gonna to get to Denny eventually? I mean, Denny, who knows about Denny, right? You know, but, but still, and I'm wondering, and, and that's not helping at all because I'm still confused. But one of the things that was true about Michelle, my dentist was that 
Michelle didn't ask, ask for my permission. It was a done deal. It was a transactional relationship. Michelle did what Michelle needed to do. But what Michelle was, was a, a professional and an adult. So Michelle had decades of trying to figure this thing out. This was not true about Troy. Troy was this adolescent. And I'm thinking that still does not help my confusion because I don't understand what this kid is going through. And then I dug deeper and I realized that what I really felt was resentment. And I hated that, but I was really, really resentful. And I thought, what am I so resentful about? And I remembered thinking about myself because that's what I thought about first was me. And I remember what it was like to be that age where you know that you are different and it didn't matter if you even knew it yourself, if you were different, that you would be called out for different. And all you ever are at that age is that you are begging for acceptance. You know how to deal with coding. You know how to walk in the shadows. You know how to slither in and out and try to figure out who is among you that you can actually get acceptance for. Because, you know, if I had attraction to somebody like me, and I was different from other people like me, then that made me beg for acceptance. And I thought, we did this thing, right? Gay is okay. Why isn't gay good enough? That was what I was so resentful for. I thought that when that girl walked into my classroom, carrying the other girl by the hand, that I understood who they were. And I did not, because what this girl was telling me was that she was not a girl at all. And I had to understand it, and I simply couldn't. So I was reminded about how when I actually did this coming out process, I grew up in a Catholic family. So the joke is that you have to come out more than once, right? So um, in one of those more than once times, I'm talking to my mother home from college in front of the washing machine. And I'm talking to this woman and she says, I don't understand this. And I don't understand why you are different. And I remember because I had done this with her more than once. I had summoned up the courage and I said, I know it's not your issue. And I know that you don't understand it, but you really are supposed to love and accept me because that's really like, that's your job. That's like, you kind of signed on for that. That's like really the thing you're supposed to do. And actually my mother took my words to heart. And as the days turned into weeks, she, she actually like stepped into it, right? It wasn't, it wasn't smooth, but apparently she became less uncomfortable. And then apparently she grew into where she could really be supportive. And then I started to sort of remembered like, you know, if that's true for me then, then it really is true for Troy now. And all Troy ever wanted was what I ever wanted. And Troy wanted all of this acceptance and wanted school to be a safe space for him. So I knew that I had to do what I challenged my mother to do. I had to love this child and care for this child because it was my job. It was the thing that I had signed on to do. And I was halting at first. Troy was not easy to come out of my mouth. Three months of school had started and I'm a creature of habit. So I tried. And once I started to say Troy, Troy out of my mouth became easier. His and him became easier to say over time. And as an added bonus, I'm looking around the classroom. I'm seeing Troy's face brightening as the days pass. I see that my students themselves don't have any problem with this transition like I wondered that they would. And so what I've learned is that kids today are more savvy and resilient than we give them credit for, and they teach us all the time. Thank you. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm always like afraid that it's not working. Um, our next performer is Marik Jensen. Marik Jensen, she, her, identifies as a multiracial Latina artist. Uh, looks like we're having some trouble uh, logging in, but I'll continue with the introduction. Uh, identifies as a multiracial Latina of trans experience, an artist, activist, and director of Social Skill Productions, a multidisciplinary consulting and coaching agency specializing in equity and innovative educational programs. She is a two-time Rocket Grant Full Project Award recipient. Her Get Woke artistic series has headlined Seattle Pride and Houston Pride, and her documentary work often focuses on the intersections of race, sexuality, identity, and community. You can follow them on Facebook at Marik Jensen and Instagram at Marik J.
Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. That was great, Luann. Thanks for sharing that story. Um, so I decided I was gonna read something about um, a piece that I wrote that actually was in the thought catalog. I wrote it back in 2009 before I transitioned. Um, and it, so there's context to it. Um, it's not something recent, um, but it was published on the thought catalog. And it was at a time when I was still uh, fucking around with white gay men. So that's important to know. Um, and so the piece is called Overheard Conversations from an Ethnically Ambiguous Faggot. I arrive home from tonight's encounter, exhausted and emotionally drained. I stare at my laptop screen. A gold star shines from my Gmail, marking a news headlining reading. Is America post-racial? After the night I've had, all I can do is roll my eyes. An hour earlier, as I left the DuPont Circle Metro Station and traveled towards a gentrifying U Street neighborhood, I overheard a group of gay white men talking about how disappointed they were in President Obama. He's not keeping up with his promises to our community, they complain. He explains that he's always been a Hillary fan and um, to emphasize this reminds the first that at the end of the day, we need to remember that Obama is still a straight black man. I exit the U Street African American Memorial Station and ride up the escalator as this group of gay white men briskly walk past a group of young black girls. One girl is loudly singing a Beyonce anthem to her friends and I am honestly surprised that none of the gay men joined in with them. When I overhear conversations that have underlying or overt racial and political issues at the core, I have a choice to collude. For when I choose to enter into these same racial discussions, I am faced with the never ending decision on how to engage or disengage with my own complicity in these problematic conversations. I suppose I'm exerting a privilege that comes with my father's half. It allows white gay men to find me just different enough to be exciting, but comfortable enough to confide their taste or choice in. I'm not threatening in any way. Earlier this evening, I've been hanging out with a man I recently began casually dating. Before I left his apartment and traveled to the DuPont Metro Station, the following conversation occurred. Preference, preference, you understand. He shares and then he begins to defend his statement, assuming he knows me. Maybe I've come off too complacent. He shares, I'm just not attracted to, insert non-white ethnic appearing darker skin categories here. He insists, don't get me wrong, I have plenty of, insert non-white ethnic appearing darker skin categories here. Then he looks back at me expecting validation and wants to insert him here. I'm safe, I get it. Last week, he took me on a date to a restaurant and the view surrounding the Grand Balcony was beautiful. A scenic panorama view of the Potomac River in Georgetown. The vivid sunset over the water was in stark contrast to the table linens, the flowers, the lights, and the people. Indeed, almost everything was white. Aside from the sunset, there was hardly a glimpse of color until our busboy came at the end of our meal, struggling in English to ask if we cared for our food to go. But wait, back up. I've been told more than often how I care to hear about how exotic looking I am. When I've been unwilling to graciously accept this label, I'm quickly challenged with cries of, but it's a compliment. Well, is it? So my mother's parents were both born in Mexico and they were brought to the United States as small children. Being the youngest of three daughters, my mother's facial features, her, her light olive skin tone and all overall demeanor granted her a certain level of uncategorical ethnic ambiguity growing up. Her oldest sister still passes completely for white and her middle sister is almost completely perceived as Mexican. So my mother herself struggled most of her life with acknowledging and loving all parts of herself. Being told that I'm exotic or being asked, where, what are you, are two types of conversations that I don't wanna have and seem to have passed along in my mother's image, likeness and my family's very intentional assimilative training. During a meal, a young black woman in laughter with her girlfriends was standing near the bar below. While I curiously asked my date why Georgetown wasn't conveniently accessible by DC Metro, he lowered his voice, his face leaning into me and responded that it was done consciously to keep certain people out. His eyes remained fixed on the young woman laughing with her friends. I swallowed my bite and didn't say a word. Then I didn't feel like engaging. Now, I feel like engaging. When he asked me earlier this evening, do you think it's wrong that I only like white guys? I paused for a beat before answering. 
well, I think to myself, girl, wait this out. This man can't hear what you really think. He persists, well, do you? I hesitate again before I respond. Yeah, I, I do think it's wrong. And no, I don't think it's a preference. And yeah, I do think that's convenient. And no, I'm sure most guys don't say anything when you tell them that. Preference, preference, you understand, he shares, assuming he knows me. My direct, unapologetic answer to his questions anger him. He insists that he is not a racist. I didn't know that I said that. He yells at me that he's very sick of white people always being attacked. I didn't know we were fighting. He screams profanities at me and raises his body towards me. I think he's gonna hit me, which would be the first time I receive a blow that wasn't from my family. My body, my body falls back into the default position it knows so well, tensing and bracing back. And I remain strangely calm. How did this situation turn from a date into a potentially violent encounter? I forget that a lot of gay white men do not like to be called out for their preferences. He adds that I must be a sexist since I'm not attracted to women. And he shouts at me the most cliche statement of all that he has black friends. Well, sure enough, I look over at his desk and I see the smiling face of a Latin couple on a Christmas card sent to him. Well, maybe not black. Subconsciously or consciously, I've allowed certain types of white men access to both worlds. A familiar convenience of understanding white America with a quick leisurely trip of a voyeuristic Mexican spring break. I believe they appreciate the stories of my ethnicity's marginalized historical narratives without the unnecessary aesthetic baggage of being too dark. There's no real threat of addressing race issues or being accountable over our discriminatory actions. It often seems to be just easier to avoid these discussions until I bring them up. And then it's my fault when I asked if I think, if when he, it's my fault when he asked if I thought it was wrong. But wrong, just like preference or such objective words. Back at his apartment, I quickly jump into survival mode, laughing off the situation and retracting my statement. I um, apologize for seeming too harsh. You know, it, now it's time to appear chill, chill. Easy breezy, beautiful cover girl. While he's still fuming with anger, I thank him for dinner, share that I should probably go and pretend I'll just wanna hang out later. I leave his apartment, flee for safety and never talk to him again. While waiting for the Metro, I think about how my honest answer to his persistent question probably surprised him. I believe he really wanted me to validate his preference and not challenge him to be accountable for his actions. When I was younger, I struggled with a certain level of the butch factor, feeling that my effeminacy may limit my job opportunities or work against me as potential boyfriend far more than my perceived race or ethnicity. I have been called fag many times, but never a spick. Here are some of the things I've heard about my appearance from gay white men. One, oh, whatever, you look white. Two, race is a social construct. Everyone's from everywhere, really. Three, you are white, quit lying. Four, exotic, insert eroticized, offensive, and dismissive comment here. And then here are some things I hear about my experience from gay men of color. One, girl, whatever, no one really thinks you're white. Two, everyone is from everywhere, really. Three, you're not black, quit trying. Four, other, insert insensitive, offensive, and dismissive comment here. But check it, I need to check myself. I've been hearing stuff like this all my life. I was trained at an early age by my parents who subconsciously and consciously blend in with my white neighbors. If anyone asks and says you're Spanish, because, you know, if anyone asks, just say you're Spanish, because being Spanish is always better than being Mexican or being from Mexico. And we are taught that we should keep up with the Joneses or the Smiths or the Franklins. I was taught subconsciously and consciously how to keep the other stuff out. So perhaps I'm still a little angry at myself because at 26, the most money I've ever made at a job to date is requiring wearing an oversized green Zhao, Jack, uh, Zhao serving jacket with ridiculous tassels and performing cultural insight and presumed authentic authenticity to guests at a fine dining French Vietnamese restaurant. While all the other male servers were questioned as to the descriptive qualities of the French infused dishes, I was probed, probed as to the correct pronunciation of the Vietnamese titles. Uh, so it's Kai Chion Saigon. Uh, can you say that again? Sure, Kai Chion Saigon. Um, what does that mean in English? Oh, it's our specialty dish. It's a seared red, seared red snapper. Are you Vietnamese? 
only one other server was requested for correct pronunciation, and she actually was Vietnamese. And the primarily wealthy and white clientele also thought it appropriate to ask her if she was the owner's daughter. The owner was not only not her father, but also white. And did the, indeed, the only Vietnamese authenticity in the restaurant came from the executive chef, an elderly Vietnamese woman everyone called Mama. She worked with an all Mexican, heavily accented line staff, and together they provided the appropriate amount of authentic Vietnamese character to the dishes. So ironically, my subtle Mexican ethnicity combined with this cultural jacket provided the appropriate level of Vietnamese character for our white patrons. As I think about this evening's journey, I'm reminded how I must have allowed this man to feel comfortable enough to confess his preference. Preference, you understand, he says, assuming that he knows me. But girl, he doesn't know me. Thank you. Uh, Marik, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I really like this idea that we keep coming across is people feel comfortable infringing on your privacy or they feel comfortable treating you like a kiosk to dispense more information and also like clemency for their actions. Like, I think that's just a really powerful thing to kind of speak on. Yeah, somebody wrote like a kiosk in the chat. That was good, good job, Mitchell. Yes, kiosk, kiosk. I don't know how to see the chat on my phone since I've switched, so I'm happy that we're all kind of landing on those notes. Um, oh, our next person is Stefan, and I'm going to switch over. Stefan is a local queer performance artist and musician. His new EP, Sis, Side A, drops on August 7th and will be available on all streaming services. Hey, everybody. Can everyone hear me okay? Can you give me a thumbs up? Awesome. Um, growing up, I have always been confused about the way the world works. Like I just never got it. <laughs> um, I got it as it was presented to me uh, in the way of a perfect family and a home and relationships and school in, in very black and white fashion. But when it operated differently, when it operated differently than the American dream that we're all supposed to strive for, I was conflicted and I was frustrated. And I would come home every single day um, and I would see my father so angry and so upset. And I didn't know why. I hated coming home and talking to him. And uh, my mom would always be like, go in and talk to your dad and say hi. And I would say, hi, how are you? And then he wouldn't answer. <laughs> And I didn't get that at the time. I really thought like this guy, like what is wrong with this guy? Like, like he genuinely doesn't like me. Like he doesn't want to be here. Um, and it really took time and me growing up to understand that he was angry because this dream that was sold to him wasn't a dream that was made for him. Um, and I knew I was gay in the fourth grade. I was an early bloomer. I was like, Bring me, bring me, bring me all of it. Bring me the sweat, bring me the testosterone, the unarmed hair, the love, me, all of it, baby. Um, and so that was my first, um, my first loss of, of naivety, right? Um, because some girl outed me to everyone and I went to like a mostly uh, white Catholic school um, and it was just a nightmare, it was awful. Uh, but I didn't really understand what being a black man and being a black queer man meant yet. I didn't understand. Um, but I did know that I didn't feel seen and I didn't feel heard. And it was hard for me to make friends and I was always not invited. Um, and so I did every single thing I could. I joined every club, I joined every activity, everything after school, anything to get me out of my house, anything to make people like me. Um, and that was my way of, of coping. That was my way of feeling like I was seen, but I still didn't feel like I was seen. <laughs> Even being under spotlights and being on stages. And as I grew up and I went to college, I drank, I drank my ass off. I drank my ass off for years. Um, and that was a way for me to feel like I was alive and that I could access this courage that I thought I needed to operate in this world because no one ever told me that I was enough. I don't think anyone ever told my dad that he was enough either. 
And so as I got older and close to his passing, I really started to understand that man so much. Um, I started to understand why he was so angry and why he felt like nothing that he did was ever enough. Um, and why he just sat there and stared blankly at a television screen and longed to get out of the house and go see his friends and um, drink to excess. And um, it wasn't until he passed um, or right before he passed, um, he'd taken me to get a tire, a new tire for my car. And you could see it on his, his face, just that like everything was coming to him. Um, you know, uh, the realization that he was enough and that his family was enough and that his wife was enough and that his job was enough. Um, and it was the strangest thing for me to see this fully realized man finally seeing himself. He saw himself and there was a night before um, this New Year's Eve uh, where I was just at a low of lows. And um, I don't think I've been able to see myself for a really long time until recently, um, until after that. And uh, I realized that instead of seeing myself, instead of loving myself, instead of knowing that I was enough, I depended upon substances. I did, depended upon um, white gaze. Um, I depended upon uh, the number of people that I slept with to uh, to valid to you know uh, to validate me. Um, I depended on the roles that I got, um, the shows that I booked, um, the streams that I got on my songs. All of these things, everything but me, everything but me. Um, and I've definitely had moments where I've had to choose to live or die, and. Um, in that moment, when I wrote this song, um, I finally saw myself. And when I saw myself, I could see my father seeing himself. And I spoke to him and I said, I see me now and I see you and I understand. Um, and I wanna be here and I'm enough and my family is enough and I need to be here for my mom and I need to be here for my grandparents and um, I need to be here for me. And so uh, instead of being on the outside, I chose to be on the inside. And through most of my life, I felt like a middleman. And that is what this song is called. So I hope that you guys enjoy it. It's off the um, upcoming. <laughs> Wish I could hold you in that stop At the fork in the road when it's left to right. When it's heaven or hell after midnight. When it's up to me to live my life. But no one's there when I look around. When I'm high in the air or here on the ground And I swear, I swear you were just there Now there's no one here to tell me why to care Teach me how to live in this world Never quite in, never quite in Now I am a little man. Can you hear me, please? Die. Everybody's dancing round the side, but nobody sees me with all that light. 
It's like the damn the day and I'm trapped in the night. And why won't you pick up the phone? I thought you'd be there because you felt like home. How am I to do this all alone? I'm on my own. Wish I knew how to live in this world. Never quiet, never quiet out. You were mine. No, I am the middle man. Kicking them in the door, I'm coming in. Cause I don't wanna be, I don't wanna be the little man. seven the same day that the EP drops. Um, so it's right behind Voltaire in the West Bottoms. It's gonna be an amazing time. Dustin Rapier's on the bill, Lava Dreams is on the bill. Um, Jared Horman is uh, showcasing some art and selling some art. Um, Deep is out right now on all streaming services. Go grab that. And uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. All of you, that was fantastic. Stefan, thank you so much. Uh, story and a song, bonus. Um, so I just wanna, I wanna switch gears here a little bit. Um, after each of you telling, you know, telling us all of these, these experiences that you have and coming from so many different, um, so many different corners of our culture um you know our local queer culture can everyone hear me i want to make sure cool um i'm just really curious and mitchell would do you want to jump in here with me um with some of these questions um one thing that i see um you know everybody, everybody's got a, something that that seems to run true throughout everyone's story uh, is how language has changed or the use of language um so you know before uh, before before Luann told her story Mitchell you you let people know that um you know that that the names were changed so that no one yes to uh, avoid dead naming any of the participants yeah um you know I'd like to touch on that uh Stefan the name of your your album is this, S I S. Uh, that word can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, especially, you know, but 
queer black people <laughs> and black people in general. Um, I just, I would like to, if you all are willing, I'd like to ask questions about how, um, how language and how things have changed in the queer culture, you know, between you know, when, when we first started out as, you know, as, as gaybies and baby queers uh, to now. Um, Joss, we, we had this conversation with you originally about dead naming. Are you willing to, to tell us a little bit about that so that people know what that means and why they should avoid it? Um, yeah, uh, I would say um, that for trans people, the concept of a dead name stems from a name that they were given to them by a guardian of some sort that sometimes they they retain into the transition and sometimes they don't. And if they do not retain it um, into a transition, um, for them to hear that name used as a way to identify them can be very triggering, it can be very dysphoric, it, it can just be rude. Um, because when it comes to trans folks, we do so much to, Im we, we fight so much to be the people that we are, to have this, this one identifier be used that follows us to the grave can be so um, draining in a lot of ways. So for a story like this, where the, all of the names have been changed to prevent dame, dead naming, it just is a way to protect anyone that is a part of those stories that hears the story maybe they're on the stream right now with us maybe they see it on a recording later but they won't hear that name they might know it's them but they, but they won't have to hear that name uttered in reference to them if that makes sense absolutely um and thank you thank you for laying that out so clearly um because i think i think that as we, 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 we develop the language to, to talk about ourselves, um, you know, as queer and trans people. And then that, that language then makes its way into like the mainstream le lexicon. I think it just, it, it helps us learn, you know, so much about each other and to normalize each other for each other, if that makes sense. Well, can I just say one last thing about the dead naming thing? Sure. The only other thing I would say is that um, for trans people in particular, why it is so important is that we build these lives for ourselves out of ourselves. And the dead name becomes such a big deal because we're all human beings that will die at some point. We all, that's the reality none of us will escape. But for trans people, the lives that we have built the name that we have built in that life does not get the same respect as the legal birth certificate name that ends up attached to us all in the wider world. So for trans people, that is really the main reason why it's so important is that I could have spent 50 years building a life of my own as Joss, but the moment I get hit by a Metro bus, <laughs> they're gonna use another name to describe me, even though I have done all this work as Joss, right? So that that is just one of the reasons why it's so important for people to respect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joss. Um, Marique, do you mind if I ask you a question? Yeah, go for it. Cool. So um, you have a, a background in anthropology. Um, which um, we've, we've had some discussions over in the past. Um, I'm curious as someone who has been able to, like you, you talked about um, you know, people saying, oh, well, you could fit into this category or you could fit into that category. Um, as you've worked with so many different types of, well, people, and then also different types of queer people, different races, uh, genders, all of it, have you noticed um, as someone who may be mistaken uh, for, you know, for someone that you're, you're not, <laughs> have you noticed any changes in the way that we relate to each other or that you are related to 
in that way over the last few years because I feel like you know the queer queer and trans communities have come a long way. We still have a long way to go, but so much has changed. What what have you noticed there? I mean, yeah, I I that's like I I feel like that'd be a long answer. There's a lot <laughs> I could talk about with that. It's a good question. Um, are you talking about like with me or like communities in general? Um, I'll start with you. Um, I just, I mean, so when I transition, like gay men don't fuck with me anymore, which is like, you know, cool. I, I think like um, one thing that I always thought, you know, like the little anthropologist in me um, before I transition, you know, um, cause I was always in sort of like a, uh, I always think of like twinks as like the um, Tinkerbells and Peter Pan where like, you gotta, you gotta keep believing in them. And one day they die if you don't just keep cheering for them. And I think I was like reaching my end of my like Tinkerbell twinkdom. And, uh, and so I think that, you know, even like though I wasn't fucking every white gay man, I was fucking some, even though I wasn't fucking all, I, I think that there was like transitioning into a woman meant that I no longer had interest or investment from them. So like they no longer had it, like I, they didn't need anything from me. So like, like on my Facebook, you know, and I had been filming a, a series on effeminate gay men for four years. And I've been following these like big personalities in New York, DC and Chicago. So I kind of like half lived in New York and DC as well. Um, and like when I, when I transitioned, it was so interesting because like there was a lot of support, but like from gay men, it was just crickets. And it confirmed what I always thought, which is that I think for a lot of gay men, if you aren't fuckable, if they don't want anything to do with you, like then, then like if they don't think there's a possibility they're gonna have sex with you, then like there's no interest anymore. And so because like, they were like, yeah, I'm not gonna fuck a tranny. Like, I think that they were like, okay, like that, that whole realm of this world that I had built for myself for over 10 years was like gone. Um, and so it confirmed sort of like, in, in, in some ways it was really refreshing. Like it was like, oh wow, this is great. Like I can be myself now. And then the other side was that I learned what straight men were like, because I, I became straight. And I was like, I never in my life thought I would be straight. And I'm straight, you know, because I, I like men. That hasn't gone away. And so now that I like men, I like straight men, it's a whole different world. So I was learning about like what straight men were like in a really intimate and real way. And, and I would say that my um, synopsis, and Miss Joss and I have had lots of conversations over cocktails about this, but I would say our synopsis on this is that I think straight men are just so limited in their ability to express emotion, to express like vulnerability to like have outlets even like identify things so i actually find straight men to be in some ways really enjoyable because i'm like oh you're just you just don't know you just haven't been given these things but like gay men on the other hand i think have been given a lot of opportunities to succeed and you know they may not have taken those how how do you think um i'm how do you fail in yeah i get it <laughs> How do you think that translates into our culture at large since you, you know, touched on, on straight men and gay men as, as a group? I mean, I don't know. I think Kansas City is an interesting place right now. I think that, um, you know, like, I think there's a lot of movement from like activists and organizers to like call out racial, you know, racial injustice and like show up for BLM. I mean, like look at our BLM march that happened, right? Like it was organized by like literally no black people and then last minute after like people of color were like, there's no black people leading this. Like the white organizers were like, oh shit, there's no black people. We can't get them to sign on in the 11th hour. So we got to just cancel it and then issue this half-ass apology. And um, I think that we have seen that, um, that, that white people really want to do work, right? Like I do this professionally. I actually teach and train white people about racial equity. So like as a trainer, I can talk about that. On a personal level, I don't have room for it unless you're paying me on a professional level, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, and I would say that white folks are really activated to do something. And I think that a lot of them are making like their second and third attempts now. And um, I think that for people of color, we're in an interesting space where some of us are watching and we've been watching this for years. And we're like, uh, uh, it's almost like re-traumatizing because it now it's like certain, certain white leaders are getting validated for like showing up and caring or like making a phone call or challenging someone and they're getting all this like accolades. And then we're like, we challenged you three years ago and you didn't say shit. And now you're gonna talk about it. So I think like, it's just an interesting time to like, 
I, one thing I've been saying is I think people of color, LGBT people of color here in Kansas City really need a space to like address this and to like really process all of the shit that's been going on. Um, I don't think that I'm the right person to lead that as a light skin, ethnically ambiguous person. Um, but I think that I should be in the room. I think that like, I would love to see leaders like Stefan and Jade be in, in the forefront of like taking charge of those conversations and leading that because I think that you know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of white fuckery and a lot of white performative action happening right now, and I would love to see like what it means for people of color who um, have been doing this work for years, like the Korea Kellys and others, to show up and be given this space to actually lead. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you. Yep. Thank you so much for that in-depth answer. That's exactly what we need. Um, Stefan and Jade. You were mentioned there. Um, would you like to respond to that? And because Jade, I've seen, you know, I, I see, yes, your your performance with Black Creatures, but I also see your commentary. Um, you have your your own little commentary series um, that I've been enjoying. Um, and I think Marik is right. You, you know, that's 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 stepping up to a place of leadership. And Stefan, um, you're you're doing the same. You're you're a Black queer personality that's out there and is now an example to other people. Um, how does that make you feel? Um, <laughs> I, uh, I sometimes don't know how to feel about it. I know that I see things and I call them out for what they are. Um, and I, 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 I feel compelled to do that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if I would love to to lead some of those conversations, I um, I love conversations. I really love conversations. I feel like everyone is is really uh, focused on conflict. I think especially when we talk about performative um, activism um, and social media activism, um, there's not really any conversations going on. It's really like who's the best white person. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it's not really dealing with like actual internal issues that, uh, the person really has and needs to get through. Um, so yeah, I would love to see more conversations. Uh, I definitely, I wrote in, um, op-ed for, um, um, in Kansas city, um, just about our spaces in general and how we don't have any people of color on staffs, really like front of house management. Um, we have one black bartender, one of my best friends, Laron Hill at Missy B's. Isn't that insane? Um, we have one uh, GM um, of color, Ace Samuels at Woody's. I mean, like, it, it just boggles me as an entertainer in this industry for so long in this, this city for over a decade. I mean, there's just so much that needs work. Um, and it starts really at the top. But I think it also starts with us realizing how much power we have in our spending and the time that we spend at places um, in actually calling people out. Um, I think that we have a lot more power than we give ourselves credit for. Um, and I hope that people like me and Jade and Marik and um, Korea and so many people in the community inspire people to raise their voices and say, that's fucking whack. You know what I mean? Like, so if that's, if that's why I'm a leader, then cool. Um, but I think everyone has the same power and the same opportunities that we have um, to use their voices. That's how I feel. <laughs> well said. How you feel. <laughs> yeah, I've admired Stefan for like, since Uptown Arts Bar was a thing, I've admired you. So I like when you talk. Also, Marique, I realized, oh my God, I realized who you were when people started saying words. And I was like, oh my God, I think that women were like, oh. You really did a lot. I'm of miss girl. They either like me or they don't like me. One of the two. For damn sure. And I love that. I love that. Those are the only, those are the people who take a stand. It's like you either really like them or you really don't like them. And I love hearing both sides because the people who don't like you be saying the darndest things, right? I haven't personally heard people talk bad about you, but just in general, I'm just like, oh. Just go oh, to a bar tonight and drop my name. You'll wait. Just wait. <laughs> right, right. It's like, oh, and that that hurt your feelings that that she did that or that she said okay um 
Um, yeah, wow. And also, thank you for name dropping. I, like you, feel almost like I should just really, it's just important for us to be in the room. Um, and we'll see where it goes from there, right? But uh, I think in regard to like what we've been seeing, I, it's, it's cyclical, it's cyclical. Um, we're in an abusive relationship with um, these systems, right? And I'm not gonna name names, the United Snakes of America, but I'm definitely gonna say um, things like imperialism and colonization and, um, you know, there's, there's just a lot of things working, working, especially over time right now, as people are starting to unveil the contradictions of things. Um, but, you know, I've been in a few other relationships that were very toxic, and it seems like every time the cycle goes back around, I learn new things. And so this time around, I have learned a little bit more about knowing when to disengage and when to really step back and protect my energy. I'm at the point, um, I, I send white people my cash app after they ask me questions. And before I start talking, I'm at that point. <laughs> a lot of times, unless unless they're already supporting me in some other way, you know. Um, there was a story, so with the, the Black Lives Matter protests, and that was intense, I mean, I just, so I went there as a medic the first day that the big protests were happening and I had to leave before nightfall. I'd been pepper sprayed three times providing medical care to people alone. Like not, I wasn't like, yeah, but the front, none of that. And I was, I was attacked. So um, that was a really, really charged time. And I feel like the things are still very charged. We're just pointing the energy in different directions because we aren't all marching now. And it's really intense. Um, but I remember one night I had helped some folks prop up this phenomenal mural of Breonna Taylor redrawn in like St. Gabriel. So she had like the beautiful glow behind her head. She had the wings. She was draped in beautiful, you know, opulent, like, like velvet. And, and she was standing on this goblin. It was just itty bitty goblin, like snatched beneath her with outstretched and there were like obviously a Glock in the corner of this mural. I mean, it was just powerful, ridiculously powerful. You know, it was an image with, with an incredible aura and I helped prop it up and in, in the plaza and more and more people have come to gather and really just pay respect. We sat there in silence listening to whatever was playing on the Bluetooth speaker and crowd of, of black people and people of color and we're sitting there paying respects to someone who left too soon and left the world too soon and in the distance a white man with a megaphone he goes okay guys we really need you up front come up to the march we really need you up front corralling us while we are mourning in the middle of a park just just Relent, come on, we need you up front. We can't get anywhere without you. And like the things he's saying are so tone deaf. It's like you need to let us hold space because you had an opportunity to try and cultivate that for us. I don't, we didn't even give you that. Y'all just took that. You just need to, just for a second, just let us grieve. Just, just, to, it was so tone deaf and it broke the circle. I mean, it really did. We were all sitting there listening to like, it was a, it was like an Ella Baker speech, like Angela Davis or stuff that we're listening to how it changed our society. Here comes this white guy in the background. He's like, come on guys, we're going to go start marching. We're going to go march. It's like, it's not your job. <laughs> like we're here, please. So it's interesting. There's a lot of tone deafness, and in the midst of all of this world, we want to feel cathartic. Many of us don't realize we've been brought up in a culture that honors death and that honors um, violence and that honors um, seeking external pleasure and seeking external validation. And so, if I mean, I feel like if you're still in that mindset, you need be able to take that kind of step back to give yourself some real love which i saw that from roach ellington she's phenomenal she helps put on gyrl garden it's a phenomenal memorial guard survivor and victims of 
domestic violence. <clears throat> but what I'm saying is, step back, give yourself real love, really genuinely, and think out. Okay, am I really ready to take on a leadership position? Am I the one who should really be starting chance right now? And if I'm in, just, just talk to people who are different from you, who are just gonna validate what you got to say, like someone else's story touched on. Like it's it's just so much bigger than that. It's so much bigger than that. When we stop looking for just catharsis, when we stop right at, okay, well that made me feel good for five minutes you know, say that thing or do that thing or make that post or block that family member or whatever. Like when we, when we keep going instead of stopping there, the reward, the payoff is just so much better. The, it's just so much better. Jay, that's a really excellent point. Um, so I think right now, everybody, like I, I really liked what you said. We're pointing our energies in so many different directions because we aren't all marching or we aren't all we are all, all directing our energy um, along with each other, it feels like. Uh, so yeah, I think having conversations versus just arguments right now um, is crucial. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and you know, following along the lines of, of language, um, you know, a lot of things that have come from, from queer activism and just, you know, the nature of, of, of how language changes and how people who are involved with, with language um, or certain terms change them. The term queer itself, um, I know, has, has had different meanings to different people over time. Um, and as wordsmiths, I'd like to ask uh, David and Luann, um, if you'd be willing, can you talk a little bit about, you know, have you experienced that word in different ways? Um, you know, say just a few, even like a decade or two ago to now. Well, then your microphone. Yeah, now, now I'm not muted. I just, I'll, I'll be really brief. I'll just, I mean, and try to be direct. Um, yeah, I mean, I really believe that that, that that word has been reclaimed. I would say a decade ago or 15 years ago, just like as an academic, um, the the most that that had been said without negative connotation was in the realm of queer theory, right? In graduate school. So um, I remember going to graduate school where all the coding was still very much there, but like this is 19, what, 89? And using the word queer liberally in academic spaces seemed to be okay. And I was amazed by that because I'm like, what is this queer theory? Like, how could we queer the theory and like deal with all that? Um, so it's been since that time that it seems like it's like seeped into like just the general parlance, right? Like we could just move through public spaces and we can we can talk about that and use that word. And it isn't it isn't negative, right? I mean, like when, when I was in, in grade school, this was very definitely a negative word and, and one that was pretty much detrimental to your life. And queer, when I was in school, was used um, to be like you were different. I mean, like you didn't even have to actually be gay if you just weren't popular, right? If you weren't, um, if you weren't in the in crowd, if you were different for any way, shape or form, like you could be called queer. And that was kind of like the death knell for getting through high school. So it's been a fabulous change, I would say over the last, you know, couple of decades. I'm with Luann. I mean, uh, you know, queer was, uh, queer was related to fag and faggot, which is what I heard pretty much from the fourth grade on through um, high school. Um, so I had a negative connotation of it, but then it started to kind of turn. I remember I saw a t-shirt and it was a um, riff on John Deere and it was John Queer. And as a rural gay, um, you know, it was a way of uh, reclaiming the language kind of in the same way that uh, we took back the pink triangle. And so I think it's the ability to transmute something from a sword to a shield and utilize it um, in different ways and transmute that power and reclaim um, that power. I also think, uh, and now, you know, thank God, thank God we're all queer. I mean, <laughs> where would we be? Um, at a Ted Nugent conference or you know, a concert and at Sturgis and you know, who wants, who wants any of that? 
Um, I do think that there's a real power in just telling our stories, you know, and I'm aware of that with um, shelf life when that existed, you know, live, but the just giving space and platform and microphone to voices, queer voices that have been shut out for a long time, uh, storytelling becomes its own act of resistance. And it's powerful what we're doing, just being our authentic um, selves, you know, in the face of oppression, the biggest bitch ass boss bitch thing you can do is be your ultimate free expression of yourself. And that's what I think about that. Absolutely, absolutely. And it does often feel like just being ourselves can be a political act. Um, Mitchell, can I ask you a, simple, a, a similar question um, as, a, as a writer, as a poet, as an educator, someone who, who works in the, the realm of words and who is unabashedly themselves? Um, a, a little story, like the first year we did um, exhibition, this is our third year, um, Mitchell walked into the room to present in like this elegant, like 1950s style, like emerald green <laughs> dress and high and like just tall ass stilettos. Um, and, and people like everybody in the room lit up. Um, we went, I remember we went out with some, you know, with some other friends, some, 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 some straight men and Mitchell, you, you were yourself. You were absolutely yourself. And they still talk about it. Um, those friends of mine, they still talk about how, how authentic you were and how great you were and how comfortable you were. And they wish that they could. <laughs> so I <laughs> has such, a, has such an impact on you. I, uh, I appreciate the idea of living in people's minds and in infamy in a way. Um, it's interesting because I think Joss and Marique talked earlier about getting drinks and talking about kind of how straight men don't have this freedom for themselves in a way. And so when you do talk to people like that, it is a lot more like you just, you don't, you haven't given yourself the permission to be you. And I think just any chance you can help someone arrive at that conclusion is just a blessing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I miss that dress. It got a tear in it. I'm waiting for it to get fixed, but it's a good one. <laughs> Hold on to it with all your might. <laughs> yeah. After COVID, I'll pay to someone fix it. That's all. <laughs> Um, well, Wolf, are we coming up at our end time here now? I think we are. Um, okay. How much time do we have? Um, I mean, if you got something else to say, you go right. I just want you know, I just need to give a little shout out to Stefan, baby. We have a little connection. Stefan is actually a part of the Adam story, but the background of the Adam story. <laughs> oh. So she's part of the fuckery. <laughs> well, I mean, it was Stefan, they were there when it was happening, but not when I was, but that was that year, yeah. So I just want to give a shout out to Stefan, honey, because I love you, baby. I've been, I've been missing you since that year, baby. That's a summer. Oh, uh, all the queer love is so heartwarming. It's been so great to watch everybody talk. Oh. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much what we're here for. Um, thank you so much for bringing yourselves to the table and your experience. It's been like more than I could hope for. Um, I also want to thank everyone for, for watching and sticking to this. There's some diehard folks that are in here that are, that, are, that are loving it. So thank you. I also want to thank um, Electrosexual and Mackenzie Atkins, who, um, and Mitchell is a part of it. As my, um, we've gotten to work with Marik on this too in the past um, for helping us produce this show every year just to center and amplify uh, queer and trans voices. Um, all of you, thank you so much for adding your voices. Thanks for having us so much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, absolutely.
Thank you all. Miss y'all. Love y'all. Right. Much love. Good night, everybody. Oh, and thank you again, Humanities Kansas, for giving us that money and making this possible. <laughs> you guys are good. You're brave. You're beautiful. That's our founder, the Art House founder, Nicole Emanuel, if you haven't met her yet. Hey, Nicole, I love you. Oh, J, 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 J. Night, everyone. Bye. Good night.